That good? That's good. Well, good, af good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here. Hope you had a good lunch. Um, this panel is financing and funding resilience. And as you can see, we have quite a gang. Um, lots of talent, lots of experience. Our biggest challenge is we have an hour uh, to cover a day's worth of stuff. So we're going to do our best to uh, keep on time. But in the interest of keeping on time, uh, I'm going to assume you've read the materials that have, and have seen the bios. Um, so we, we won't go through that, but please do take a look because they're pretty impressive. Um, one, we, we, we really do want to have time for questions, but as often happens, we may run out. We'll try not to, but we're hanging around. We'll be here to answer questions, and so we'll get to them. And Heather and I will gather them up if you don't have a chance to talk to somebody. Um, the way we're going to do this is uh, each of the panelists is going to take a couple of minutes to introduce themselves and their organization and uh, identify one or two of the priorities for their organization to give us some focus. Um, and then we are going to have a series of questions uh, observations and interaction among the panelists. Um, we, we had sort of a dry run earlier today, um, and if we if we could have recorded it and and showed it to you, you you would have you would have had a giggle. It was um, lots of fun, lots of candid conversation, and so this is going to be uh, terrific. So we'll we'll go down the row with the quick intros by each of the panelists, and then we'll come back and get into some questions. So Pam, if you'd start it out. Absolutely, thanks so much, David. I'm Pamela Williams, I'm the head of grants at FEMA, I'm the assistant administrator of grants, so I am the lady that signs all the checks that gives money to state and local government. I'm really, really excited to be here to talk to you about um, probably one of the hardest things, how to spend federal money, um, and I'm excited to say that 2024 has been named um, the year of resilience at FEMA, so pretty excited to talk about that and how we drive resources into probably some of the most at-risk and at need communities across the country. So really excited to be joined here um, by these colleagues and really excited to see this room filled with people um, that are dedicated to um, decreasing risk across the country. Thanks. Uh, I'm Tanya Bonitatibus. I have the honor of serving as your Savannah Riverkeeper. I am also the um, member representative for Waterkeeper Alliance. So I'm the elected uh, head of over 30, there's 36 countries that Waterkeeper Alliance operates in. There's over 360 of us worldwide. I have an easy job compared to them. Um, but the, uh, our, our work right now is uh, largely focused in trying to help our local, or excuse me, our, our more rural communities and those that need to access some of the federal funds. How do we work with them to try and get funding into those communities? And also with that comes the obligation of meeting some of those federal requirements, which is also, a, there's often a big gap. Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patrick Howell. I'm a program manager for community res resilience initiatives at IBTS. That's the Institute for Building Technology and Safety. We are a nonprofit organization that really specializes in disaster and resilience planning. So conducting vulnerability assessments, identifying strengths and assets as well, and putting those into roadmaps for primarily small and under-resourced communities. And so one of the things that, I, that I'm looking forward to talking about this afternoon with you all is how these small and under-resourced communities can really put together these resilience plans and not only have the plans, but then take them out into the streets to actually implement um, given limited capacity, given limited resources, et cetera. So glad to be here. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mary Boyer. Um, I'm from the World Bank. I'm a disaster risk management specialist there. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the World Bank, our mission is to end extreme poverty, promote shared prosperity on a livable planet. And we do that through lending money to poor countries. 
and I know that sounds kind of exploitative, <laughs> um, <laughs> but we do it at well below market rates, concessional lending, and it comes with a ton, a ton of technical assistance. Uh, and so our, the lending comes in the form of investment projects like building better roads, building more schools. It also comes in the form of budget support um, and countries can take on loans for, for those matters as well. Um, so we focus on all, a lot of areas of development, education, agriculture, water, macroeconomics. I work in the disaster unit for the last seven years. I was uh, based in DC but working on the Caribbean and I've recently moved to the global unit, but I still have uh, a lot of work in the Caribbean. I think my role on this panel is to talk about some of the ways that uh, Caribbean islands are, are managing resilience and, and funding it and financing it. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Robertson, principal of AWR Consulting. As a consultant, we've been retained by the city of Tybee Island, Georgia to uh, develop and manage their resiliency programs. Uh, a show of hands for those of us, uh, for those of you who joined me on Monday for the Tybee tour, so you got to see firsthand. If I say something inconsistent today, be sure to, <laughs> to call me out. <coughs> uh, I, I think in the in the context of this panel, we are the case study. Tybee is a very small coastal community, 3,000 full-time residents, but we are a popular beach resort. As many as 60,000 people during the summer high weekends. We had six and a half million dollar, uh, six and a half million people visit us last year. Um, we have been fortunate enough to get some grants and get some funding at state and federal level, which we can talk about. And we have been held up um, nationally as a small community getting things done with resilience, mostly the beach, the dunes, the backwater, stormwater. Uh, Tybee's resilience is primarily flooding. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. I get it. Here? Did I? Uh, thank you all. As you can see, a uh, terrific panel, uh, lots of experience uh, coming at funding from different perspectives. And that's really part of the plan to get a sense of, you know, where funding might be available, what are the challenges in getting it, uh, what are sort of lessons learned uh, from those who have been through it that has some real world application for those of you that are sort of going down the same path or exploring going down the same path. So with that, um, let me start with, with Pam. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Pam for many years now, my <laughs> friend, don't you think? And, and we've, we've talked about uh, you know, the, the, the many opportunities and challenge, challenges that FEMA addresses um, and my experience with Pam is she's one of the really good guys. She, she sort of understands how things work. She works to make them work for other people. Uh, all communities, uh, big, small, underserved. Uh, and so her perspective and candid comments about what FEMA is doing, what it can't do, uh, what you may want to consider if you're trying to figure out how do I get that money I figure I hear that FEMA has. Uh, Pam has been kind enough to offer her insights into those questions. So Pam. Wow, thank you, David. Um, so like I said, spending federal money is really hard. Um, and I think a lot of people know that, that FEMA gives out billions of dollars every year post-disaster, how many people in this room have been impacted or work for a community or an organization that deals with, with disasters after the fact, rebuilding? Certainly Tybee Island. <laughs> well, right now, particularly in the 20, after 2017, after Harvey, Irma Maria, FEMA is making a concerted effort, and particularly um, after the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, there is more money on the street than ever before to try to help draw down disaster costs and losses in pre-disaster mitigation. And I say that because I don't know that if these opportunities will ever come to us again. There are more programs at FEMA and in other federal agencies right now that you can tap into as nonprofits, as um, 
public sector businesses, as, you know, like I'm thinking of like utilities, um, I, as local governments, as tribes and territories, as state governments, than ever, ever, ever before. But it's hard. And if I can say anything, and we can talk about this on the next panel as well, FEMA resources don't come quickly or easily. And it comes, you need a lot of technical assistance. And they can come through organizations like we have represented here. Um, but the most important thing is that first, you got to understand the risks that you face. First and foremost, what are the risks and the hazards that you're facing? And then two, how do you draw down those risks? Because if you can't answer those questions, I can't help you. Because you got to understand what are the cost effective and risk reducing things that you're going to do to draw down that risk. So I'd love to talk to you more. I'd love to help you map your way to some great federal resources and hopefully some federal resources that you can blend with your own resources and other private sector resources and maybe even some banking finance um, because we've got to get you to the point that you are going to be impacted by a disaster. So how do you bounce back quickly and get people up and running? Pam, if I can follow up on that, for, for those who hear what you say and want to do what you just said they should do, but don't have the capacity, the resources to do it, how do, you, how do they move forward? Well, there are a lot of there are a lot of resources out there. Um, I can say probably the first and best place to start is to reach out if your local government is to reach out to um, your local government resources. Like there are county emergency managers, there are also state hazard mitigation officers that provide a tremendous amount of resources, and almost all FEMA resources will flow through your state. But FEMA also provides a tremendous amount of technical assistance. As a matter of fact, we are putting millions of dollars on the street right now directly to communities to provide technical assistance and help you build grant application for what we call our Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program, BRIC. It wouldn't be FEMA if we didn't have an acronym for it. Um, so we are trying to put direct technical assistant resources into your hands, understanding that it's really, really hard to do this. We are also starting to partner with nonprofit organizations that are being funded by tremendous organizations like the Walmart Foundation, like Liberty Mutual Insurance, that they're putting navigators into these communities to sit side by side with you to help you pull the right people to the table. Right? Because these are hard conversations. These are intimate conversations. It's hard to work with city councils. It is hard to work with county commissioners. To understand risk, to get this through the political process, and to find the resources to do the right thing before tragedy strikes. But FEMA has resources, other federal agencies have resources, and some of our great nonprofit partners have resources. And people are standing at the sidelines right now wanting to help. Thank you, Pam. I would just add that uh, all of the panelists, are, we're trying to put together, as you can see, we don't have slides, so we don't have stuff to put up on the wall, but we're trying to pull together uh, resources uh, for you to, we will get to you so you can follow up and see. Pam has a number of great resources. Uh, Tanya, who's gonna be talking in a minute, does as well. And so we're trying to pull that together to make it easy for you to go follow, follow and find stuff. And Pam just mentioned something that I'll just add. Following this panel, we, we're having, we have a panel on uh, insurance and risk. And th the reason we're doing both in sequence is because we think there's a close correlation between the two. You need to understand them both and as you will see, if you stay for the next panel, and please do, we hope to tie them together and show you how they all work. Tanya. All right, that was uh, one, I don't belong in this stage. So like, it's pretty intimidating sitting up here. So if it takes me a second to get going, that, that's why. Um, but as a keeper, how we kind of came to this and, and why I'm sitting here and what we're trying to do is 
Um, keepers are real good at showing up and saying, hey, stop doing that. We don't want you to do that. Hey, um, that's human poop just going straight into the river. Could we stop doing that, right? And um, what the reality is that a lot of those communities that are facing that um, aren't doing it because they want to swim in poop, right? They're doing it because they don't have the resources to put it together. Or more importantly, nobody's really communicated to the elected officials the need for the importance. Nobody wants to dig up the street when it causes this big ruckus when you could just uh, you know, ignore the, the storm drain underneath. And so where we've kind of gotten to is that one, we can't be everything for everybody. Like our, our river basin's 400 miles long, is 10,000 square miles, and we get hundreds of calls a year of people saying, please help. Um, and we need communities to be able to do this stuff over and over again, to be able to build in the right way. So what we're trying to do is to help our small municipalities and our counties be able to bring resources in and to share, right? So um, make things that are replicable. Like um, we wanna have it so that we know what kind of ordinances we want in places, you know? I would like it if you actually kept at least the first inch of your storm water on site, for example. Things like that that will help us so that my fire department isn't having to put themselves at risk after the next flood when they should never have been in the neighborhood to begin with. So that's really what it gets at the heart for us. Um, on the table, you'll see there's like little QR codes. I've compiled a grants list, and it is a list of every grant that I can find that I think would be helpful for our work. Please use it. Share it with every single person that you meet, and if you find other resources, share them back to me so that I can add them, because that's what people need. They don't need to log on to Grant Station at $1,000 a year or whatever it takes, or try to figure it out. Like, let's work together to do this, because those resources are gonna go somewhere, and they should come down to the damn dirty south, because we need it. So there's, there you go, there's mine. <laughs> so, uh, say no. what you think, right? That, that was what I think, that's, it, that's what I think. <laughs> uh, well, and, and, and I've seen her tool, and it's terrific, and Tanya's put a lot of work into it, and uh, encourage you to use it, and again, we are going to take other data sources and pull them together that we hope will be sort of a comprehensive, as we can get it, sort of resource for you to follow the things that we will be talking about uh, today and later. Tanya, one, one other question for you is, you know, we're, we're looking at unique ways to fund things. How does Waterkeeper, as, a, as an NGO, fund things? And what does it fund? So, so Waterkeeper Alliance, as a nonprofit, we beg from a bunch of different foundations, but um, there's a, we get a, it's member supported. Uh, the, the one, so I'm involved with Mosaic, which is a governance model that is trying to break some of the, the traditional funding um, that happens within the nonprofit space. If you guys are not familiar with the, it's called a Mosaic Movement is how you find it when you're Googling. Uh, but it's a governance assembly that's been brought together where foundations have given us about six to ten million dollars a year to give out back, you know, get to give back out into the community. A huge portion of that work has been focused on IRA funding for the last couple of years uh, because of two things. We recognized, one, there were going to be projects that were funded that we didn't want funded, and that's already happened, right? There are projects that are getting federal funds to build facilities that will be highly polluting in our communities. That is a fact. And so we wanted to enable and engage people so that they had a voice in that process. And then the other is to try and help people understand the resources that are available so that they can, they can move them forward. So there are some really interesting opportunities that are starting to raise up of trying to change the way that foundations make decisions on, in the, on the private sector. And that's really important because the people that sit around the room and decide who gets the grants um, really does have a drastic effect on who's getting that money. So that, that wasn't Waterkeeper, but it is Mosaic. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> very helpful, thank you very much. Uh, Patrick, uh, you gave us a little insight into what you are doing and you work with local governments on uh, financing opportunities, challenges. Um, what, what have you learned and, and what recommendations would you make given your experience and expertise to 
small municipalities, smaller towns uh, that have their own unique challenges individually and sometimes collectively and as regions to uh, achieve getting financing. Right, yeah, and you know, so, so with this question, I, I wanna take a little bit of a different approach, if I can, because I Fire think away, yeah. we, we've got um, a wealth of expertise here in terms of banking and finance and grant funding, and so w what I'd really like to do is kind of talk about how to do more with less so for those um, you know, smaller communities or those that, that don't have the capacity to really be pursuing these grants, acknowledging that there is a, a transformational amount of money out there right now that, that could be um, pursued. Um, but we've heard throughout this conference, throughout the last couple of days, how there is that lack of technical capacity or even organizational capacity to write the grants and to administer the grant is a, is a whole, whole other ball game, right? So in order to you know, kind of do more with less, some of the things that, that I've learned from the communities that I've worked with, I, I would say my number one lesson that I've taken away is awareness and communication within the organization. And so what I mean by that is oftentimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing and that there can be some synergies between certain programs, let's say between public works and between emergency management that they don't even really know about where they could be leveraging resources. They could be leveraging manpower, they could be leveraging funds um, to really be driving towards mutual benefits for both of those, both of those departments within an organization. And so that, that would be my first tip for those, at least the 8% of you that are in local government um, that uh, are trying to figure out how do we really move the needle with resilience initiatives in, in our own community is, is leverage existing resources, leverage existing projects, and it often comes by just having better communication between, between your departments and breaking down some of those silos. Patrick, what has your experience been in getting municipalities to collaborate so that they can collectively get to scale uh, to do things that they cannot do by themselves? Yeah. So, I, of course, it's a mixed bag because every, every community is different. Um, I would say oftentimes there's a little bit of resistance because I think a lot of agencies, departments within an organization are relatively self-interested, right? As they're developing their own budgets for the budget year, they're thinking about what do we want to do, what do we need. They're not necessarily thinking about the organization as a whole. Um, and so they can be sometimes resistant to that conversation. Um, but every time that you actually get, to, to keep with the same example, a public works director and an emergency management together in the same room to actually talk about where they could actually leverage some resources together and share resources, there's, there's this light bulb moment that you can almost feel in the room, right? You can almost say, oh, we don't have to be so concerned about ourselves. We can be more concerned about the organization as a whole. We can be more concerned about the impact that we could jointly have in the community and when that light bulb goes off, then that, that changes the whole game. Um, because then you can have more open conversations about different ways to identify resources, different ways to share these resources, and then actually move towards implementation. Thank you, that's <clears throat> very helpful. Mary, um, you gave us a little insight into the World Bank and what it does. Uh, and I've certainly learned over the last three or four days as we've been talking about what we're now talking about, what the World Bank does and was surprised to learn all of the things that it does and how what the World Bank does in other countries uh, have application to needs and strategies within this country. Would you, would you address that, please? Yeah. Um so, I mean, first of all, Caribbean, the big obvious difference, Caribbean countries can be hit by a hurricane that causes 225% of GDP in damage. The United States is hit by large hurricanes but has the ability to absorb the damages a bit, the cost of damages a bit more. So when we talk to Caribbean countries at the World Bank about disaster management, a lot of it's about cost and fiscal space and literally the ability to, to avoid a budget deficit or avoid an economic shock. When we talk about disaster risk management at the World Bank, we talk about the ability for 
countries uh, for to keep natural hazards from turning into disasters. When we talk about disaster risk financing, it's about making sure disasters don't turn into economic shocks. So historically across the Caribbean, countries have been impacted by hurricanes. They sit and they wait for international assistance to come. They have very, very limited budget freedom to spend on recovery. So they wait for international assistance to come. It's, it's not timely, it's not enough, it's too late. And so all of the progress that Caribbean countries have been making in development comes back a few steps. Poverty dips back down. People on the edge of poverty go back into poverty. So how can we ensure that countries have cost-effective decisions about disaster response financing? And because we're a bank, we came up with kind of a formula and an approach, something that can be scalable and replicated across countries uh, through a disaster risk financing technical assistance. And the, the biggest pillar of that is quantifying your risk. Um, and Pam was just talking about understanding risk. Understanding your risk is a huge part of it. You're not gonna purchase, you're not gonna create your savings fund, purchase insurance without really understanding what your risk is and what you're purchasing. So using probabilistic models, we can help countries to figure out the costs of their risk um, and what they might expect to pay on an average annual basis over the long term. So if we talk about hurricanes specifically as a starting point, we can say, look, if you have 2% of your GDP in average annual losses from hurricanes, that might be you know, $10 million, maybe that's the kind of funds you should put aside for a rainy day um, so that you can easily access in, in a reserve fund, for example. Uh, and then we talk about for those more severe events, you're probably going to have to rely on e external assistance. So the bank and other international financial institutions come up with these lines of contingent credit, essentially loans that can pay out when someone declares an emergency. This is one of the best products that the World Bank has, in, in my opinion, because all of the difficult work is done up front. So I sit with Dominica, with St. Lucia, with St. Vincent, for example, and for six months during blue sky times, we put together a loan agreement that focuses on development policy objectives like uh, passing a new disaster risk management law or ensuring that your adaptive social protection system has funding channels set up correctly. All of the smaller pieces of disaster management and social protection that should be in place for when a disaster strikes and you need fast response. Putting together all of that work, signing the loan agreement, having our lawyers talk, and then there is you know, $50 million sitting there for when you declare an emergency, you get that money within 24 hours. And we don't care how you spend it. So that's a really cool, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's something that's really helped Caribbean countries to act quickly because we all know that the, the faster you have funds available, the, the more lives are saved. Um, and then the, the top risk is you know, risk transfer instruments for really catastrophic risk when it makes financial sense to buy insurance and transfer your risk. Um, and I'm almost done. But <laughs> the, so we, if we talk about like reserve funds, contingent credit, uh, risk transfer, at the bottom of this, at the base of all this, is reducing your physical risk. So it doesn't always make sense to just pay for response, pay for response when you could be reducing your risk. So through that same quantification of risk, we also help countries to prioritize where they get the most bang for their buck in, in reducing their risk through retrofitting um, public assets or infrastructure. Because countries need support oftentimes in making these kind of decisions with very limited fiscal space. You could do the sexy thing and buy you know, build a new international airport, or would it be more cost effective and save more money over the long term if you invest in your highway and bridges systems? So helping countries make those decisions and coming up with real financial strategies for cost effective response is what we do. Thank you, uh, wow. Um, I don't know about all of you, I mean, uh, Mary has been sort of tutoring me about some of this stuff for the last two or three days and it's, um, it's, it's very impressive to see the work that the World Bank is doing. Mary, did, did most of the work the World Bank is doing is out of this country. Have, have you, yeah. do, do you have some thoughts on applications of things that have worked that might have application in the United States? Yeah, 
Um, <laughs> We, we've talked about a few of these, and I think we'll talk about them more also at the next panel, um, too. Things like parametric insurance, which you'll hear a lot about later, um, as opposed to indemnity insurance. It gets you money faster and at a lower rate. Um, there's ways to insure using that same type of parametric insurance, insuring municipal governments, state governments, national governments, or individuals and small businesses. Um, so across the board, there's cost-effective insurance policies. Um, for example, in in Dominica, um, small island Eastern Caribbean, there's a this um, product in place from Global Parametrics. Do we have anyone from Global Parametrics here? Global Parametrics? No. Um, it's and you can an individual can purchase livelihood protection insurance through their credit union. Um, and they get a payout if a hurricane of category three or 100 miles wind speed, whatever the parameter is, comes within 200 miles of, of the coast. Uh, so innovative insurance products like that are one thing. Access to lines of contingent credit are another thing um, that I think, I don't think the United States is really using. Um, and that would require some challenging conversations with financial institutions. Um, but having immediate liquidity is the key. And so whether that's in the form of a grant or a loan, um, having those prearranged mechanisms is, is very key. Um, and I think another thing that's really worked well for Caribbean governments, because they're so small, <laughs> and I mean, in terms of the public assets that they, ha they have under their purview, they can literally have every government built asset in an inventory, and have the, the condition and valuation assessment and everything about that asset right there to really do true risk-based asset management um, and understand exactly where they should be using their very limited resources uh, instead of making um, you know, decisions on the fly about what they're investing in. Thank you. Uh, and as Mary mentioned, there, there, there are a number of crossovers between this panel and the next panel in terms of uh, funding and insurance, uh, and you, you will see how they connect if you stay for the next panel. Uh, uh, always, <laughs> always, always. Okay, Alan, you're up. So as the case study, let me <coughs> tell you what Tybee has done in the context of everything you've just heard. Admittedly, this is thinking backwards, but it all resonates. So Mary talks about FEMA and what FEMA is built for and what FEMA can and can't do. I mean, uh, sorry, Pam. Sorry. <coughs> uh, when Tybee, uh, when, when Hurricane Matthew hit Tybee in 2016, it was $8 million of damages. It took four years to get that money back from FEMA. As part of that, we needed to lift some homes. We have a lot of at-grade Tybee cottages. We need to lift homes. That took about four years to get the first funding for that. Of course, in the interim, Irma hit us, Maria hit us, Florence hit us, Dorian hit us, okay. They are not built for, for fast recovery. Uh, so we can talk about that next session. <laughs> that being said, <coughs> Tybee, before BRIC, Tybee applied for the what they used to call the pre-assessment grant. We'll give you money to figure out what it is you need to ask us for money for. We got the money. We did the assessment, stormwater plan, right? We quantified our risks. Right. We built to a 10% storm event, which is seven and a half inches of rain in 24 hours for Tybee. We now are going back to FEMA to fund the projects that came out of that stormwater plan. So at my perspective, we're doing exactly what FEMA is built to do and what we're, what we're asking them to do, and they've been fabulous. And GEMA you know, is my representative, and they're, they're great. And we have another. Uh, we got that one for uh, $250,000. We got a $2 million grant, and um, now we're applying for an $8 million grant. They keep getting bigger because our projects get bigger. So well done, uh, but we know how we could address some of that. Tanya talks about uh, River Keeper. Um, Tybee is, on, is in, obviously, the Savannah River watershed. The Savannah River watershed has been identified by NIFWF, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as one of the, I think, f six or seven critical watersheds of the United States where there are enough habitat and people and things at risk, but you can do something about it, right? Which is why we got a NIFWF grant to do an assessment of our back river, which is the tidal salt marsh on the back of the river island, which is where we recognize most of our flooding, okay? 
So both instances, basically playing back to the authority what they're asking you to tell them and quantifying it. Uh, I, I, I come out of sales, okay? I just wanna know, as we said yesterday, what's in it for you? I wanna know what your pain points are. I wanna know these, these organizations are desperate to put the money out, okay? Desperate to put the money out. They want to give you the money. But that's not an attitude that's shared among municipalities and others. It's like a, an afterthought, which I'll talk to you. But I'm telling you what, they will tell you in the RFI. They will tell you in the FOMI. This is what we want. This is our priority. This is what we do. If you can match up to that, you're going to get the money. Appreciate that's a capacity issue. Um, Patrick, my God, you know, I will make a plug for a consultant, although yesterday folks said I don't want consultants, I want my own talent. Thank Fair you. enough. But the minute you have your own talent, they are in a department. Right? And my DPW, Tybee, really doesn't, you know, finance for them is just someone who won't let them spend money the way they want to do it. Right? And they absolutely have no grant writers. And they absolutely don't care about the funding, just give me the money because there's urgency about DPW. Right? It took someone outside that organization to be able to pull the pieces together. And Patrick, as you rightfully said, when you can pull the pieces together for them and everybody wins, then they're all on board. And Mary um, didn't say it this way, but what she's talking about is a capital structure. Okay? Why would you think about your reserve ahead of time? And that would be equity. You know? Why wouldn't you set up uh, a revolving credit or some kind of credit line ahead of time? When would you go for a grant? Okay? You don't just do a project and then say, how am I going to fund it? Let me go for a grant. They're overwhelming. I can't get them. They're bureaucratic. I never get the money. I'm going to suggest to you that you need to think of finance right up there with assessment. Assess the risk. Plan the risk. Design your mitigation. Right? Get your research. Got that. You're all over that. That's what most of you in this room do. And then you come up with an assessment, you come up with a plan, you come up with a design, and you go, how am I going to fund it? And the city always says, too expensive. Right? Or, or you can't get everyone in the population to rally around it, because half of them want it and half of them don't. Build in the river, don't build in the river. Okay. I'm suggesting very strongly that you need your finance department or a consultant or someone who can get ahead of that and say, you can't possibly mitigate for flood, and Tybee's a flood issue, but I would say wildfire, I would say drought, anything that's approaching you. You know it's coming, you've done an assessment. You have to right now work on the financing of that. Funding and financing is the title of our talk. Right? And that has to be layers. It's not just grants. It's just not the city paying for it. It could be loans, and they're appropriate. Okay, it could be sources of loans. So at this point, Tybee basically has complied with everyone who wants to help it. It listened to them. I'll include the DNR there, because we've been a recipient of the DNR Coastal Incentive Grants. They've been a fabulous partner. We talked about permitting earlier today. There are issues with permitting. There are issues with large state and federal bureaucracies not being nimble enough to keep up with us. Uh, but they're there with us, so at least you can have the conversations. But at this point, uh, we have a matrix. We know what our projects are. We know what all the grants are. We track them. Certain projects will be better aligned with certain grants. It's not blind. Um, Tybee's issue at this point is we're a small island, three square miles. Um, we need to be more collaborative. We need to have a bigger impact. We need to go for more money. Uh, the only way we can do that is to collaborate with folks in this room, including the other states, the larger county of the state. And again, where federal and state agencies are lagging is they don't yet recognize a scope of work that is not um, adjacent. What I have to do with my salt marsh is exactly what Whitmarsh has to do with theirs, is what Brunswick has to do with theirs, but we are not we're not beside each other, and they don't yet have that in their scope. Just like FEMA, FEMA's trying really hard to fund nature-based solutions, but they do not have the methodology and analytics and engineering results, as we talked about today, to be able to do that. So we're looking for ways to bring FEMA together with NIFWF, each in their own realm of comfort, but we were fortunate enough that we did a nature-based plan at the same time we did a, a pipes and pumps plan. And Tybee now has a stormwater plan that is based on both of those. Our pipes and pumps are sized because we're going to do some horizontal levees and some, and some living shorelines and some rain gardens. And they talked to each other. But we had to make that happen. That, that's, 
that's not going to happen. So I hope as a case study, I reflect back what you each have said and say, yeah, in hindsight, when I hear you say it, yes, I'm not saying it's intentional, but I, I, can, I can work my way back. <laughs> Terrific. Um, I've known Alan for a good while now. Uh, we, we started talking about plans like this four, five, six years ago, and we're talking about parametric insurance when nobody really knew what parametric insurance was. Um, as a former banker, uh, Alan brings and has brought to Tybee a perspective, and you just heard it from him, that is badly needed in, in the things that we're talking about. A hard-nosed financial analysis that is at the beginning of the discussion. Uh, Alan has been successful because he did that. And his ability to attract grants and funding for Tyvee is, is largely a function of that. So if lessons learned from Alan's great work is to look at how he's doing, and I think he has some things he might be willing to share about what he's done, lessons learned from a business perspective that goes to funding issues and that need to be done on the front end. So congratulations. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, there's a, there's a um, you know, people, people who aren't in sales have a bad impression of sales, <laughs> okay? But the world revolves around sales. And there's a concept in sales um, that I've, I've always, I've, has always worked, I thought, um, and that's SPIN, bad an acronym, of course, because that's what you all think. But basically is what's the situation, that's your assessment, what's the problem, that's your vulnerability, what are the implications, okay, just because I have a problem doesn't mean I care about it, right? When people start to see the price tags on some of these things, suddenly a couple of hours of nuisance flooding is not that bad. All right, I'll put my boots on. Okay. Um, the situation problem implication, which is measuring the risk and why does it matter and what is at risk and where's that C going to rise, uh, leads you to um, the need and the need. When I came into this uh, business with and helped Tybee, <coughs> um, I think I benefited from the fact that I'm a project manager and a finance background and I don't know the science and I'm not an environmentalist, and I'm not an engineer. I mean, the disciplines that are represented in this room, I've never worked for a city. So there was a bit of a, I understand the need for an assessment, the need, the problem, I got the implication, right? But I wasn't wedded to a particular design, I wasn't wedded to a particular issue, I was trying to get the thing done, which is about project management, holding people accountable, you know, bringing a hard nose, yeah, in your dreams, okay? And, and appreciating that the banker, the bankers, okay, the banker matters to me. If I can't get the money, I can't get the work done. So I have to pay attention to what the banker's telling me. And what the banker's telling me is they tell you. So you just pay attention to it. That seems to be, I, 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 my, my experience is that's lacking, okay? Because everybody's got coming from their perspective of the, of the project. Cool. If, if you can augment thanks, that, you'd be good. Yep, thank you. Um, we have, we're, we're doing pretty well on schedule. We have time for 10 or 15 minutes of questions uh, and would love to have them. Um, a great chance to put questions, add some observations, be kind. Uh, to those or don't be kind. Panelists <laughs> who, um, who are here to try to help. Use mine. Um, thank you. This was really uh, an interesting discussion. Um, so my question is more about, you know, how we determine who's eligible for some of the um, sort of the, I guess, a favorable financing or even the funding. And I've seen this certainly in the U.S., but also would be curious about from the international perspective. 
you know, in a lot of cases, for example, um, who is eligible for some of the best programs, funding, financing uh, terms, um, it's hard because, like, maybe there is a small island country or a census block, in your case, um, where um, there maybe are people who have vacation homes there that are multi-million dollar vacation homes, and it actually throws off uh, sort of the income metric for the entire population that lives there. Um, so with Justice 40, for example, we're seeing communities, particularly on the coast, people who live there year-round absolutely fit the Justice 40 definition. But because there are multi-million dollar vacation homes there, they actually are not designated as a J40 community. And for an international standpoint, I imagine there's something similar that happens in countries where there's a lot of external investment or whatever that may be, so that the people who are living in that Caribbean nation would technically qualify for more favorable financing, but because of this, they do not, and so therefore, it's hard to build back better uh, in those cases, especially because the financing terms that you would get are not actually something that you can absorb. So I'm just curious about how you all are thinking about how we determine who gets those most favorable conditions, whether it's from the funding or the financing side, and is there an answer or solution to this challenge? I can start really quickly from, from FEMA's perspective. So um, particularly in um, with regard to our, our disaster mitigation projects, um, a lot of them, the, the main legal requirement is cost effective risk reducing. Um, so even when you are, and we do a lot of things to try to target disadvantaged communities, but it really comes down to the project. And a lot of those, it, it does get difficult when we're trying to do nature-based solutions, right? Because we're talking about a lot of bricks and mortar. Um, so we are talking about those, we, we're talking about that ROI. Um, but I will say the big thing that you get hung up on with a lot of FEMA projects are, wait, 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 wait. I have a, a nonprofit that's really doing a lot of really good work or wants to be a key part of this. How do I get there? And we've, we've gotten to the point where we can get really, really creative with that because like a community can apply for the benefit of a nonprofit or really involve a nonprofit, but still the community is, do, is being the applicant. So what I always tell people is force FEMA to tell you why not. Why does the answer have to be no? And we've gotten a lot better because right, no is the easy answer. <laughs> and FEMA has gotten better and really tried to pull and stretch to the extent of our authorities because we do have a beautiful set of authorities. So. We have, while we do have a couple of Justice 40 programs, most of our programs right now are gonna hinge on that ROI. I'll try to respond briefly to this, but you just touched upon one of the biggest challenges in the, the global aid architecture right now. It's a huge conversation um, and uh, about especially countries that might be ranked as middle income or even middle high income or actually the Gini coefficient, the disparity in wealth is quite, uh, shows that there's quite um, a big difference between poor communities and the wealthier communities. And especially in the Caribbean, there has been a call from Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley. She's at the last COP. This is called the Barbados Initiative. She's pushing for more reparations for climate-induced loss and damage. For wealthier global north countries or even the countries that are more so the producers of greenhouse gases to be paying reparations to countries and areas who are receiving the biggest brunt and the impacts of climate change today. Um, a lot of conversations happening and huge important voices in the global south are speaking up and a lot of the small island states are, are carrying this. And something that um, I was sharing earlier I think is really interesting in terms of how do vulnerable communities access international um, support or best practices? And um, a lot of municipalities and states in the United States can't access the same kind of international assistance that like St. Lucia can, for example, because it's a sovereign nation. The European Union has recognized this in that saying they realize they have these territories in the Caribbean, like Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, um, St. Bart's, that are, if anyone's thinking about this, you think about a nice, wealthy island, but not, not so. <laughs> there are wonderful vacation homes, um, but there's 
hugely um, vulnerable indigenous communities that were incredibly impacted by COVID-19 with drops in tourism, and they had not the autonomy to be able to increase their social protection payments. And so there was children starving in Aruba because they could not increase their social protection because the decision in the Netherlands Anyway, I'm getting too far into it. All I'm, all I'm saying is that the United States can start rethinking the way it supports its vulnerable communities who are heavily impacted by climate change. And I think it requires uh, an a introspective look at highest levels to see how they can do that creatively. Thank you all. Um, and Ellen, I appreciate your comments about the need to layer. Um, and it's true, there are more federal resources than we've seen ever, maybe. Um, I'm curious about two layers that maybe haven't been discussed. Um, one is private um, investors um, and the markets. Like, what's the role? What do you see as their role moving forward? Whether that's in a cap bond reinsurance capacity or in some other capacity. Um, and then also community pools, and, and I'm thinking, there's, you know, the t concept of community pools on insurance has come up, but also like community land trusts are starting to be used as a mechanism for affordable housing, not just land conservation. So I'm curious about your thoughts about the role of the private um, sector, private markets, and then community mechanisms. I'll, I'll start. <laughs> uh, I've been coming to these conferences now for five years, <coughs> and I'm struck by the fact that they never have any financial people at them. There's no insurance representation, banking, private equity, hedge funds, ESG funds, mutual funds. There's a lot of money that could be attracted to the work that needs to be done for a lot of different reasons. Okay. Um, and Tybee yeah. itself is looking at land bank. Um, because eventually in 30 years with six inches of sea level rise, which is mid to, mid to conservative, okay, we will lose our edges. Tybee's not going underwater. Tybee's a young island and still growing, but there are elements in that marsh where it's just problematic. There again, the city has to get ahead of that. W one of the comments I heard at a prior conference, uh, that the actually uh, at the uh, Atlanta uh, Resources Council, <coughs> someone said, um, we need to be kinder to our future selves. Every issue on Tybee is man-made 60, 70, 80 years ago when they used the marsh for dump and then they built it and then they built on it to, at the time, raise the, the, the property tax rules and add more people. That's what they wanted to do. And every issue we have, I can go back to the 20s and 30s and tell you that you did it. As someone said yesterday, we have to stop doing what we've been doing, okay. Um, I, I bring that up though because uh, in addition to the land bank, which is uh, I think an integral part of any community thinking about its land use today, is the parametric insurance because you cannot build to a Cat 3 storm. If we get hit by a Cat 3 storm, we're done, as Mayor Johnson said yesterday. I can build to a 10% probability event, that's cost effective, that actually could happen, okay? And I can mitigate that. The only way that any community could come back from a devastating storm, and we, I, I feel like Tybee's a bit of a Caribbean island when I hear you talk, Mary, because uh, we were lucky with Matthew, and Matthew skirted us, and Matthew hit Tybee Literally, Cat 2, just came down from Cat 3, Cat 2, okay, 100 miles off the coast. And we had severe devastation and $8 million worth of loss. If that had come much closer, you'd be talking multiples of our annual budget in, in losses. You, I believe you need to have an insurance policy just like you insure your home, just like you take out life insurance. I mean, there are things that if you are a wealthier community, I know communities who will not spend money because they're waiting for the big one, and you can never have enough money because the big one's going to hit you. So in the meantime, they're not mitigating their flood, okay? They're not improving themselves. On the converse side is there, there are communities that don't have barely any reserve. Both of those ends need an insurance policy to, to free up funds and mitigate flooding or to uh, build back quicker and, and not have to wait for FEMA. Right, because those, those, those policies, as Mary was talking about, that's 30 days, cash in the bank, no questions asked, that's what you paid for, and what would that allow a Tybee to do? 
In Matthew, we were off the island for five days. Maybe we're off the island in two days. And the quicker you can get people back in their seats, get the water going, the electric going, the less pressure you have on these large bureaucratic organizations. Everybody's calmer, everybody's back doing their thing, and you have more control over what that gets spent on. And there's plenty of room to go to FEMA for reimbursable expenses, no, no doubt about it. Never replaces, never replaces, it's just a first layer of loss. So that, probably more than you asked for. Uh, Tanya, you have something you wanted to add? Just two quick things. One, uh, community benefit agreements, if, if you don't know what those are, those are super important if you want to look at resources and how resources can be spent to help um, make us an or, a, a organiza or not a, a community sustainable, making sure that as you bring industry in, there's a conversation with that community about what they want is important. Um, the other, real quickly, that we've been doing is uh, when we sue somebody, if there's a settlement, we actually put it with the local community foundation and we create a grants program. That grants program then is created by the community itself. We have one in Anderson, South Carolina, for example, has been functioning for a couple of years. And so now I've got um, elected officials and community members that are sitting down with me and figuring out how we're going to spend money that is changing narrative in a bunch of different ways. Thank you. And David, if, no, if please, I... Please go ahead. Yeah, if, if, if I may, just real briefly, I know we're just about out of time, but I, I really like this question because it provides an opportunity to blend several things that we've heard, again, over the last, last couple of days. And, and that is, you know, finding partners in areas that you may not have expected, right? So thinking about the, the community-based partners. We, we heard from um, Alicia in Savannah. Alicia, where are you? She's still here. About finding, finding some of these partners um, to, to implement programs. And some of these par community-based partners even already have their own funding. Um, and so they just need someone else to come help them. Um, Dr. Kilpatrick, we heard from you yesterday about how it doesn't cost anything to create relationships, right, other than perhaps a little bit of time and effort. And so I think that there are community-based organizations out there like community development finance institutions um, that are doing a lot of this work, especially around affordable housing and a lot of these um, these CDFIs, community development financial institutions, are beginning to, to recognize the importance of building codes and building resilient to natural hazards and to climate risks. And so therein lies some opportunities that may not be super obvious on the surface, um, but if you really dig into the work that is already being done in your community by certain stakeholders, um, you can find opportunities to, to leverage and even match funds and resources. Yeah, those are great thoughts. I would also add, I do a good bit of work with public-private partnerships. And just as Pam mentioned, if FEMA has money, the private sector has money and, and is looking for ways to engage with the public sector um, in, in ways that make sense for their business, their shareholders, their communities. And there does need to be some ROI on what the private sector does, but it's not all about the money. It's, a, it's about the plan and the impact and the scale. So the whole opportunity with public-private partnerships, whether it's sort of loose in the sense that, you know, they're not contractual and not driven by state law, or true public-private partnerships that build infrastructure and bridges and dams and airports, um, they're all important. And, and that's evolving, because it's needed. More questions? We're on it. I know we are on it. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, Heather was gonna Heather just gave us the hook. Heather was gonna give me a hook. Well, it, we've been getting it from the back. I, I know, <laughs> well if I may, thank you panelists for a terrific panel. Uh, it's been an honor to work with you on this. And thank you folks in the audience for hanging with us, uh, paying attention and asking questions. And hang on for the next one. We're up in the, again in about 15 minutes. <laughs>